So I'm all set. Are you set too? Shall we get into the topics of today? Okay. Um, give me just a second. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, so stopping to drink water just kind of reminds me that yoga becomes a lifestyle. Yoga becomes not just something that you do when you stand on your mat and you move and breathe, but, you know, it becomes uh, pervasive throughout your whole life, like this concept of ahimsa, practicing, you know, doing any kind of activity really in a way that is suitable for your body, that's comfortable, that is not causing you any harm. You know, stopping to drink water at the beginning of a presentation is a practice of ahimsa. It's stopping and recognizing, okay, my body needs something right now, and I'm going to take care of my body so that I can continue doing the work that I need to do and, you know, be present and not be coughing and uh, not be distracted because I'm feeling thirsty. So anyway, I will undoubtedly weave more of this yoga philosophy into our discussion over the next three weeks. Um, okay, good. So what I have in mind for today, <clears throat> excuse me, is to, uh, there's a lot of content that I want to cover. So I, I tried to organize it a bit. And what I'd like to focus on today are two main topics. One is um, breathing. So in other words, why do we breathe? What are the benefits of breathing? Um, how do we breathe? So we'll talk about that. And then <clears throat> we're going to also talk about, actually not in this order. First, we're going to talk about asana practice. So we've just done the asana practice, but I want to give you a little bit more context around how to practice asana, when to practice asana, how to develop your personal routine. Um, and then we'll talk about the breathing. And then we're going to spend a good chunk of time talking about sleep, which is one of the three pillars of health, according to Ayurveda. And in my mind, it's the one that we need to get under control first. Once we get that under control, then we can start making changes in other areas of life. If we were, for example, to try today to start working on um, making adjustments to our eating habits, it would, it, like, we're, we have too many stressors, we have too many things going on in life. But if we manage to get our sleep under control, that will, you know, bring the stress level down significantly, and then we will have the capacity to start working on other things. Um, okay, so the first topic then is um, the asana practice. So you can just do like a show of hands. You can either click the little raise hand button or you can just raise your actual hand so I can see where is the raise hand button. I don't even know. I think it's under the chat or something. Anyway, maybe just raise your actual hand and let me know um, how many, like number one, is anyone practicing daily? Does anyone have a daily yoga practice currently? Yeah, kind of, some people. Okay. <clears throat> is anyone practicing um like two or three times a week. Okay, we've got a few people practicing two or three times a week. Uh, what? Uh, it's in reactions. Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, is anyone just like really struggling in their practice right now and they cannot manage to get on their mat consistently at all? There's no shame in that. Like we're working on all the things today. All right. So we have some people who are there too. Okay. <clears throat> so um, when we're trying to work on our stress, it's important to, I wonder how, how do I do this? Give me a second. Okay. I'm lowering hands now so that when I ask another question, you can raise it anew. <laughs> All right. Um, where was I? Sleep. Uh, no, not sleep. Asana practice. Um, yeah. Okay, so when we're trying to work on stress management, um, I think the best choice is to work from gross to subtle. And so, um, you know, the grossest part of the yoga practice is the asana practice. So that's a good place for us to start. We need to figure out how do we get on our yoga mat to start practicing consistently. Consistently will look different for everybody. Um, so that we can start using the benefits of the asana practice to help us 
with stress management. So um, there's, there's a few um, key um, tools, I guess, not tools, uh, tips, key tips for how to develop your consistent yoga practice. And it's different for everybody. Everybody has a different life. You know, some people work, some people have children, some people work and have children. Some people are caretakers of parents or, you know, older family members. Um, you know, some people are morning people, some people are night people. And so there's no one size fits all strategy for how to develop your consistent yoga practice. You have to reflect and, and you know, look at your own life. You're the expert of your own life so that you can figure out where to fit your yoga practice in and how. Um, so there's the first tip, you know, figure out what your life looks like, what is realistic for you. It may not be a realistic to say, okay, starting tomorrow, I'm going to do yoga practice every single day. We need to start with baby steps. Maybe decide this week I'm going to practice yoga two times because on Tuesday and Thursday morning, I have time available, you know, because of my appointments or because of, you know, how my schedule looks. I actually have 30 minutes available to do yoga practice on Tuesday and Thursday morning. <clears throat> and that's the second tip that the yoga practice doesn't need to be an hour long. Oftentimes we have the perception that yoga needs to be 60 minutes or 75 or 90, and it really does not. If you have 30 minutes, that's fantastic, amazing. If you have 20 minutes, that is also great. 15 minutes, wonderful. Um, I would aim to do at least 15 minutes of yoga practice to help you get going and start establishing the habit. Once you establish the habit, let's just use this example of Tuesdays and Thursdays. So say you block out 30 minutes on Tuesday morning because, you know, you're going to need time to set up your mat. You're going to need time to grab your props, figure out what yoga practice you're going to do, and then you can start. And then you're going to do 15 minutes of practice, and then you need a few minutes to wrap things up and put stuff away. So, you know, plan... Um, Plan a yoga practice that fits within the envelope of time that you have available. Um, the next thing is, what are you going to practice? <laughs> uh, you know, you have the intention, you're going to, on Tuesday morning, get on your yoga mat for 15 minutes, but what are you going to do for those 15 minutes? Um, or maybe you have an hour or, you know, whatever time, uh, amount of time you have available. Are you going to log in and take a class? Are you going to practice with a YouTube video? Um, do you have an idea of what you want to do? Maybe you have some notes scribbled down of these are my favorite poses and, you know, this is what I want to do. Any of them are fine. And it, all of those are correct. Um, but it's good to have a plan and know what you're going to do that, so that when you get on your mat, you're like, okay, I'm here now what? <laughs> and then you end up spending 10 minutes trying to figure out what you're going to do. So plan it ahead of time. And um, that way, you know, you'll get on your mat and do something and get that done. Um, some other tips for developing a consistent practice. One is a lot of people do much better with accountability. And so accountability can look lots of different ways. Maybe you're going to put a star on your calendar when, you know, you do your yoga practice. Maybe you're going to journal about it. Today I did 15 minutes of yoga practice. I worked on this. I noticed that my left shoulder is tight or my hamstrings are tight, or I think I need to work on core strengthening. You know, you can write down whatever um, observations you have from your practice. Sometimes um, for accountability, it's a good idea to have a buddy who's also doing this, someone who has the same goal as you. And that way you can check in with each other and say, hey, it's Tuesday. Like, don't forget tomorrow you're going to do your yoga practice. Okay. Okay. It's Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Let me check in with my buddy. I did my yoga practice. Did you do your yoga practice? That can be one nice way to um, keep yourself accountable. Another thing, this is, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of of two minds about this. I've done it before and I think it's beneficial, but it can also turn into something else. Um, you can do uh, like a social media post and then you're accountable to your, you know, your social media friends. Um, and they'll start to see that you're doing something new. They'll encourage you and say, oh, you know, that's cool. 
That's cool that you're doing that. Good for you. You're taking care of yourself. The reason I'm of two minds about it is that, so I, I did this several years ago. I decided that I wanted to start learning how to do a handstand. And so I decided that every day I was going to do a handstand and I was going to record the process, um, you know, just to kind of keep myself accountable and because it's entertaining for people to see that kind of thing and whatever. But after a while, it started to feel like a chore and it started to feel like a responsibility. Um, and it can also kind of turn into an ego thing of, wow, look how amazing I am. I'm doing this yoga practice. So just be aware of that going into it, that um, you want to just kind of be careful to keep your ego in check and, and remember why you're doing that. You're doing it for the accountability of keeping yourself consistent. Uh, don't let it like stress you out or like put pressure on you or anything like that. But there's lots of different ways. You may have even additional ideas about how you can keep yourself accountable and motivated so that you're keeping up with your yoga practice. Um, let me see if there's anything else I need to tell you. I think that's about everything related to the asana practice. Do you all have any questions or comments? Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, a, a, a comment. Yes. Um, I think the other thing when you're trying to develop a daily practice is practicing ahimsa because it's really hard. It I mean, really hard. I, this, this has been my goal since July to try and get to a point where I'm doing this daily and it's a habit. But I'm fighting 30 years of a different habit of getting up and going to work. So yes. trying to move myself to getting up and giving myself time first and then going to work is not something that, you know, a habit's formed in three weeks. It is not a three week process. This <laughs> I think is going to be all year for me when I mm -hmm. start looking at it. I figure, I figure a week, a year, maybe I'll get of, of trying to correct 30 years of Changing an um, old habit. Not thinking, yeah, not yeah. thinking of myself first. Right. It's, um, it's, it may get there, but yeah, yeah. hard. You know, um, in this vein, um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, hold on. I lost my train of thought for a second. In this vein, oh yeah, I know what I was going to say. Society doesn't support us doing this kind of thing. We, you know, are expected to get up and be productive and get moving and, and, you know, we're not supposed to take time for ourselves. Um, but another thing that you can do is surround yourself with like minded people. So this may be like on social media, like people who are really, um, you know, on a similar path to you or someone who's already doing a good job with making time for themselves and their self care. Because the more that's normalized in your brain, uh, the more likely you will be able to follow suit with it. What is that thing about your five best friends or something like the people who, whatever, you know, your community of people really have a big influence on, you know, how we think and our habits and things like that. So that can also be a good help. And I was really focusing on if you're doing uh, a practice with a video or with like your own notes or your own idea of what the yoga practice should be. But another great way to keep yourself accountable is to like join an actual class. And that way you start to like have community with the people who are there and, you know, people will notice if you're not there. So if you show, if you miss this week and you show up next week and say, Hey, where were you last week? How come you didn't come to practice? And so that by itself too is, you know, pretty motivating. Yeah. All right, and there's a couple of comments coming here in uh, the chat. So let me look at these. Is there an evening equivalent of sun salutations? I don't know if it's true, but I asso associate them with morning practice. Yep, that's a good association. Sun salutation is a greeting of the sun, and so they're intended to be done in the morning or during the daytime. They're kind of energizing, like a little bit too energizing to do at nighttime, and they might actually disturb your sleep. So it's better not to do them in the evening. If you wanted to do a sun salutation in the evening, okay, so we're getting into kind of like advanced topics here. You can, you can do it, just go slowly. 
um, and take breaks. That way it doesn't become overly energizing. Um, now, is there an equivalent? Um, there is, you know, people make up all kinds of things like in this modern world, um, people have adapted all kinds of uh, yoga sequences and stuff. And there is something called a moon salutation, I think. I don't know how it goes, but you could look it up and and see, like now that you know the name of it, look up moon salutation and see if you find something that looks interesting that you'd want to work on. Um, yeah, otherwise you can, um, I don't know, I have... I have several videos about uh, yoga for evening, like unwinding from work, letting go of the work day, um, yoga before bedtime and stuff like that. So that can also give you some ideas about practices that you can do in the evening. You really can't go wrong with um, lying down yoga postures, like a, um, say you're doing 30 minutes of yoga, do at least half of it lying down so that you can relax, so that you can, you know, transition more easily to sleep. You could even do your whole entire practice lying down in the evening. Um, does a breathing practice have the same benefits as yoga, or do I need to incorporate movement? Okay, that's a great question, and that's exactly what I'm going to talk about next, so I'm going to hold on to that for just a little bit. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So it doesn't need to be in the morning. It can be wherever you fit it in. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the yoga practice can be any time of day. I like to say, well, you know, it's not just me. <laughs> Even the ancient yoga texts say that if possible, it's best to do your yoga practice in the morning. You know, if it, if it fits in your life, because <clears throat> usually throughout the day, stuff comes up, like, I don't know, you have a flat tire, or you're suddenly running out of gas, and you suddenly have extra responsibilities that you didn't realize you needed to do. And then they end up taking time, of course, and before you know it, the day is done, and you haven't had time for your yoga practice. So if you can manage to do it first thing in the morning, you're more likely to be su to successfully complete it, you know, and not have it get pushed off of your schedule. Um, that said, you know, the morning doesn't work for everybody. And so if for whatever reason, your work schedule, your, you know, circadian rhythms, whatever, if you want to practice at a different time of day, it is perfectly fine. There's no reason not to practice at lunchtime or in the evening or in the afternoon or whatever. The only guideline is to make sure that you're, that you, you're not eating bef like immediately before you practice. We should mostly practice yoga on a somewhat empty stomach. So um, the guideline is if you have a snack, wait two hours after your snack to practice yoga, or if you have a heavy meal, wait four hours and then practice yoga. So, you know, generally it's a good idea to um, do your yoga practice and then have your meal. Like if you're gonna do it at lunchtime or at dinner time, or have an early dinner and then do your yoga practice right before bed. Okay, cool. I think we've covered a lot about the asana practice and how to make that work in your life. Oh, you know what? There's one more thing I need to tell you. It's a very good idea to try to have a consistent time of day when you do your yoga practice so that it can become kind of uh, automatic, like on autopilot. Um, if you try, for example, on Monday, I'm going to practice at 7 a.m. and on Tuesday during my lunchtime and on Wednesday in the evening, it, it's harder to like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's harder for that to become a routine um, as compared to, you know, every day I'm going to practice before I eat lunch, that can become more automatic. Like, you know, wake up, brush your teeth, you know, that kind of automatic is what I'm talking about. Okay, now let's go ahead. I have a question, I'm so sorry. Sure. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just trying to reconcile what you said before and what you just said. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we we can pick any time during our day or schedule to practice, but it should be the same time every day? If possible, yes. Okay, and so how about the practice? Should the practice be the same every day too? <sighs> yeah, so it can be. There's a lot of benefit to doing the same practice every day for a while, not forever, but like maybe for a month. Um, 
it can change if you prefer. It just, it kind of depends on the person. If you're a person who will easily get bored and then give up on the yoga practice, probably it's a good idea to change your practice every day. If you're a person who's been practicing a while and you're like a little bit more mindful, a little bit more patient, then it may feel comfortable to do the same yoga practice every day for a week or two weeks or a month. Yeah. So is the consistent time just to establish a routine or are there other reasons for it? It's to establish it as part of your routine. Yeah. So your body just, and like, it's just automatic for you, you know, um, because that'll make it more likely that you will do it. So if you already do it, mm -hmm. it's not so important to do it at the same time. Yes. Yeah. If you already have a routine of on Monday, I practice at seven mm -hmm. and on Tuesday at lunch and it's working, it's fine. You can okay. continue with that. Yeah. Yep. Jenny, go ahead. Um, yeah. I, my problem often is that I want to do the poses that I like and that are easier for me to do <laughs> and not the ones that are, I know I need to work on like my core and things like that that yeah. are more challenging. So um, for me, um, mm -hmm. What do you have any suggestions <laughs> to um, help me gradually ease into doing, you know, um, you know, sometimes I try and do the harder ones first, because then I can like, you know, enjoy the easier <laughs> ones. But I, I mean, I don't know. I find I that that's a challenge for me a lot. <laughs> what's the last thing you said? I find that's a challenge a lot to, mm. to do the ones that I know are harder and yeah, I don't enjoy well, as much. One, one, um, <clears throat> so if so if you're like showing up to a class like I know you do um you know pretty frequently then you're going to do whatever the teacher asks so you're going to get your mm -hmm. core strengthening and you're going to do things you like and things that are challenging also but if you're trying to practice um independently all of the time or some of the days of the week um I would suggest that you make a plan and follow a video um so that um you give yourself some accountability. So um, you may already know, uh, all of you may know already that I have a monthly practice calendar that I create. And so that can be one form of, you know, following a plan. It's prescribed for you. Um, of course, you can make adjustments if you need to. If you don't, if a video is not appropriate for you, you can always select a different one. But that way you're getting a variety. You know, when I plan out that calendar, I plan some days we're going to have a longer practice. Some days we're going to have a shorter practice. Some days we'll be stronger. Some days we'll be gentler. I try to just make it very well-rounded so that, you know, everybody can get a well-rounded practice and get what they need. If the practice calendar isn't the right choice for you, you can make your own calendar. Maybe you write it down, you know, on your calendar uh, or, you know, your Google calendar or whatever and say, this whole week I'm going to do Zalinda's uh, gentle core strengthening video. That's what I'm going to work on this week. And then you hold yourself accountable to it. And next week I'm going to work on, you know, gentle strengthening for the lower body or something like that. And that way, um, you, you know, you, you just give yourself a little bit of accountability, you know, when you are cognitively <laughs> planning and thinking rather than like trying to make a spur of the decision, kind of more emotional uh, decision when you're already on the mat. Mm -hmm. yeah okay can I ask can you you did it for October the empty calendar that mm -hmm. was so helpful for me okay like it really, it really if, I don't know if you can do it all the time but maybe yeah. like the next two months that was very very helpful I think because it came from you I did it yeah because I was thinking <laughs> about my own calendar and I was like looking at a calendar that I got from you was helpful with me yeah. filling it out and doing it so that yeah was Yep, I'll absolutely do it. And um, what I'm planning to do, I haven't told anyone this yet, but what I'm planning to do is make something like a journal for 2022, you know, for all of my patrons, which will include all of the monthly blank calendars and places for you to write notes. So look forward um, to that in January. Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad you're excited about it. I see some thumbs up. Okay, um, very good. And then there's one more comment here. After shifting to work from home during COVID, I lost my I don't have time excuse to practice consistently. 
my commute time has been replaced with yoga. That's fantastic. That's such a good thing, <laughs> like a silver lining of the pandemic and working from home is that we don't have to spend the time to drive to where, you know, wherever the yoga class is and then, you know, set up there at the yoga place and then do the yoga practice and then pack up and drive home. <laughs> you know, that, that one hour yoga practice turns into two hours or two hours and 15 minutes. Um, whereas if you're doing it at home, you just like turn on your computer and go and then you're done and you end up saving a whole bunch of time. Yeah, I like that too. That helps me too. <laughs> One day I will reopen my physical yoga studio because um, I do also enjoy teaching people in person. Um, and, you know, maybe all of you can come and visit some at some point, but um, there's definite benefits to being able to practice from home. The 2022 calendar will be digital um, and it'll be probably inside of my Patreon. We'll see, like I haven't totally planned it out, but it'll it'll be a digital thing that everyone can print at home. Um, yeah, I don't know anything about like printing and shipping things. So I'll just make it digital and send it out. Yeah. Okay. Now let me see how we're doing on time. Ah, okay. I have still a lot to cover, but don't worry. We have three whole weeks. So if I don't get to everything today, we can shift it to next week. Um, let's have a short chat about breathing and then we're going to have a longer chat about sleep. So breathing practice, um, we had a question earlier about does breathing practice have the same benefits of yoga or do I also need to incorporate movement? This is such an insightful question and it's a perfect segue to, to this next phase of discussion. So you know how at the beginning I talked about how if we want to manage stress, if we're you know working on developing our yoga practice, we work from gross to subtle. So in the realm of yoga, you know we have the eight limbs of yoga asana the physical practice is gro is grosser it's the most gross and then more subtle than that is breathing practice so typically for most people who you know most people in our modern world who are busy and have a really busy mind it would be extremely challenging to just like pick a person off the street and say here please sit down we're going to work on some relaxation you're going to do breathing now like they wouldn't be able to do it. It might even be agitating for them and uncomfortable and stress them out more. So for most people, um, we need to start with asana first. Um, this is such a broad um, topic. Let me try to boil it down a little bit. When I say start with asana first, I mean, when we first begin yoga practice, like I'm a brand new beginner, I've never done yoga before. First thing you should do is work on asana. Then maybe in six months or in a year, it can be time like your brain will be ready for you to start working on breathing. So there's that timeline. But also there's the timeline of, um, you know, I woke up this morning and I'm gonna go do my practice. The first thing I need to do is my asana practice to kind of get my brain organized and prepared. After 10 or 15 minutes of asana practice, then my brain's ready and I can sit down and I'm prepared to do breathing and it will be a beneficial practice rather than an agitating practice. I hope that makes sense. So just generally there's a spectrum of moving from gross to subtle and that can be on a long timeline of years or it can be on a short timeline of like within the span of one hour. Um, that said, also we have um, this idea of ashrama dharma, which means um, our responsibilities at different stages of life. So if we think about a young child, it'll be more difficult for a young child to be able to sit down and do a, like a meditative breathing practice than probably like someone our age, like an adult person um, you know, who has had lots of life experiences and it doesn't have all that crazy energy like children have in our older age, we're more likely to be able to sit down and do breathing practice. So I'm kind of giving you maybe more information that you're, than you're interested in, but everyone's different. It depends on stage of life. It depends on stage of where you are in your yoga practice. Um, for some people, it may be appropriate to sit down and just breathe. Um, but for many people, it's necessary to do some physical movement first. So like to get your body and your brain ready so that you can sit down. Does that make sense? Do y'all have questions about this? 
Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I hope that that will make sense from like a yoga practitioner, like a yoga student perspective. I kind of gave you an answer from a yoga, like as if you're all yoga teachers. <laughs> um, but hopefully that makes sense. Um, yeah, so long story short, you can sit down and do just breathing. Oh, and then your other question here is about, does breathing have the same benefits as yoga? Breathing is more beneficial than yoga. As we get more subtle in the yoga practice, um, the benefits become greater. So um, yeah, from a mindfulness perspective, from the perspective of the purpose of yoga is to quiet the mind, which is what the Yoga um, Sutras book teaches us. Um, breathing is more powerful and more beneficial in helping us to be able to calm our minds and manage stress and all of that. Okay, good. Um, okay. Okay, now I have a message, I mean, a, a note here. Let me just read it real quick. Uh, okay, let's see another one. Okay, yeah, so the questions that are coming in now are having to do more with like uh, the actual practice of breathing. So now let's move out of the philosophy of breathing and start moving into the actual practice. Um, okay, so breathing practice, um, when we are starting to work on breathing, let me start at the beginning. We, um, our intention is to lengthen out the breath, to make the breath smooth. Um, oh, I'm having trouble scaling down. I'm like trying to tell you all the details and all the stories behind everything. But let me just um, leave it as we have a goal of lengthening out and smoothing the breath. Um, we'll leave the why for another day. Um, we have an inhale component of breath. We have an exhale component of breath. We want both of the components to be smooth. We want them to be approximately equal in length or we want the exhale to be a little bit longer than the inhale. I'm gonna tell you the why on this one. The reason we want the exhale to be longer than the inhale is that the exhale is um, connected with the relaxation response in your body. So you know you have your fight or flight, your stress response. We also have a relaxation response. The inhale is associated with your stress response and the exhale is associated with relaxation. So that's why we want the exhale to be a little bit longer, just slightly longer, like one count longer, just a tiny bit or equal. But we don't want for the, all the inhales to be long and all the exhales to be short because that will be agitating. It will like increase your stress level. So how, how do you manage that? We have a question, Nikki, go ahead. Yeah, is, is that why we pause? between them sometimes that's, that's that's kind of why we pause yeah it's kind of why we pause we'll get into more details of breathing as we go like um i'll teach a little bit of breathing every week is what i mean so today i'll try to just give you a foundation of information and then we'll start to get into different kind of breathing practices so uh or where, where, where was i i was talking about lengthening the exhale and letting the inhale and exhale be equal or letting the exhale be a little bit long. Let me come back to the questions here to make sure that I'm uh, answering in the right way. Okay, yeah, okay. So how, how do we start to work on the lengthening of the inhale and the exhale? There are all kinds of different breathing practices that we can do to help us. Um, today, so I'm going to give you some homework at the end of today, and then you can work on this stuff and we can talk about it next week. But today let's work on a little bit of breathing practice. We did some earlier when we did our asana practice, I asked you just to do three long, smooth breaths. So that's a perfect way to start. Like that's a perfect beginner level kind of breathing. Um, but let's start to work a little in a little more detail about how to smooth the inhales and the exhales. Um, there's kind of a relationship, I think, between the length of the breath and the smoothness of the breath. 
So you might use different kinds of tools to help you manage your breathing, to help you start working with your breathing. One of the tools is that you can use counting. You can use, um, some people like this and some people don't. So just kind of for the moment, be open-minded and just um, hear, hear it. And then you can decide whether it's for you or not. But you can do, I'm going to like verbalize what I would be thinking in my mind while I breathe. So you can do like inhale, one, two, three, four, five. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five. You can use counting like this to help you establish the cadence of your breathing. It's actually called ratio breathing when you start paying attention to the numbers like that and you're trying to keep an equal ratio or like we, I mentioned earlier, the exhale component is longer. Um, that's one tool that you can use. Some people like it, some people don't. If you don't like it, another thing you can do is you can just say, like in your mind, like inhale, like kind of stretch out the word in your mind, kind of like a visualization. Exhale. And that gives you, it kind of gives you some encouragement to lengthen it out. Another thing you can do, I'm giving you a lot of information really fast. <laughs> Um, I'm going to just give you one more tool that you can try. So there's different nyasam techniques. Nyasam is when we use the hands somehow to count or to support the breathing. And today I'd like to show you about sliding nyasam. So you can slide. Let me remember how this goes. We're going to slide down each finger and back up. So you start with the tip of your thumb on the tip of your index finger. Inhale, slide down to the root of the finger, exhale, slide back up. And then you can skip to the next one and slide down and slide up. And so this is kind of a means of counting the quantity of the breath, but also pacing yourself because you can notice you have the sensory input about, oh, I'm going fast here. Oops, I went too, I went too fast on the exhale or oops, I went too fast on the inhale. Let me slow it down a little you can notice um, you know, how your pace is. So there's three techniques there. One is the counting. The second one is the, the visualization or just like in your mind saying the word inhale or an exhale and lengthening it out. And then the third is the sliding nyasam. Nyasam is, if you're taking notes, it's N-Y-A-S-A. -A. Nyasa or nyasam, they're the same. Um, okay, good. So, okay, and then I have a question about breathing and meditation. This is a great question. Um, this is this is a great question. Do I have to do it at the same time as yoga? Okay, so when we're talking about um, moving from gross to subtle, we have yoga, like the asana practice, then we have the breathing practice, and then we have the meditation practice. So the meditation is the most subtle. Um, so if you want to, to do breathing and meditation, you can do your breathing practice first because it's grosser, and then you can do your meditation practice. Or if you want to do all three, you'll do asana, breathing, and meditation. If you already have an existing meditation practice and you want to do just that, you can. Now, let's talk about the relationship between breathing and chanting and meditation. So um, a breathing practice can be a meditation practice. Meditation means that we are training our mind to focus on one thing. And whenever you're trying to train your mind or train anything, you have to start easy. So for meditation, what that means is we first train our mind to pay attention to something for an instant, like I don't know, maybe I'm meditating on this glass of water. So I observe the glass of water. Oh, suddenly I'm thinking about, I need to take my dog to the vet later. Oh no, I'm supposed to be meditating on the water. I'm bringing my mind back, paying attention to my water. Oh, my mind wandered off. I like have this other appointment I have to do. Let me not forget to do that. And so we're just like for a moment able to focus. And then inevitably our mind will wander. 
and, and we keep reminding the mind to come back. So, you know, in these eight limbs of yoga, we have um, yamas and niyamas, which are like, um, they're kind of like the 10 commandments. They're quite similar to that. It, it gives you information about how to live, how to conduct yourself, how to behave with other people. And in fact, there are 10 of them. There's five yamas and, and five niyamas. And then we have um, asana, then we have pranayama, then we have pratyahara, which has to do with learning how to be in control of our senses and not letting our senses like wander off and distract us. And then we have the three steps of meditation. There are tarana, that's where you focus for an instant. Tiana is where you start to be able to focus a bit longer. And then samadhi is when you're able to be fully absorbed, fully concentrated on the thing, whatever your object to focus is. So focused that you don't even notice anything else happening, you know, around you or in the world or anything else. So, you know, even within meditation, it there it kind of also moves from gross to subtle. So you can really start to refine your meditation practice um, over time. Um, I'm kind of talking in a circle. So breathing can be a meditation practice because we're trying to keep our mind focused on something. We're focusing on the counting. We're focusing on the smoothness. We're focusing on lengthening the breath. Like it is certainly possible for your breathing practice to be a meditation practice. Um, chanting is a form of breathing practice. It's a you know, it's, it's one of the different, of the many, many different types of breathing. We can talk about chanting maybe a bit more in week two or three, if y'all are interested. Um, and then, yeah, and then I guess one more detail here is that in meditation, you don't necessarily have to focus on breathing. You can focus on anything, anything that is um, basically something positive, like you wouldn't want to meditate on something that's harmful. Um, so. So yeah, okay, good. Um, okay, I think I've gotten through all of those questions. Um, so breathing practice, I've given you three different techniques that you can work on. And then as part of your homework, I, I would suggest that you work on them, <laughs> try them out and see how they go. And then we can build on those uh, next week and I can give you some new breathing techniques to work on. Let me just take some notes here real quick. And then I'm going to continue with uh, sleep. <clears throat> 